Um, you've got another Northern English accent to put away for the next 10 minutes. So I'm going to talk about sports supplements. And obviously, it's a really loaded topic. Um, no way can you get into the nitty and gritty within 10 minutes. So hopefully what I'm going to do instead is just generate some thinking around the whole balance and debate between the science and the hype in, this, in the sports supplement industry. So just to kick off and set the scene, I guess, a little bit with the industry in general, specifically in Australia, here you can see um, the Australians, uh, sorry, Australia's complementary medicine uh, industry snapshot from 2018. And what I'm trying to highlight here is it's very clearly a multi-billion dollar industry. So there's a lot of money to be had with the sale of sports supplements. It has grown uh, considerably over the last five years. No doubt it will continue to grow significantly. Um, and for the sake of definitions today, we're not going to get caught up on all the various definitions, but what I'm going to refer to today as a sports supplement is basically anything that could appeal to an athlete um, that could improve potentially health or performance. So why supplement? Now, a really good paper from the International Olympic Committee, or the IOC, um, was released last year, and they basically listed seven key reasons as to why an athlete might choose to supplement. And I'll just quickly touch on each, each of these. So number one, correcting or preventing any kind of nutrient deficiency, so key examples being vitamin D or iron. The convenient provision of energy and nutrients, for example, your protein and your sports gel type supplements. Obviously a big one, um, a big one that appeals to your athletes is a direct performance benefit. So for example, thinking about your caffeine-based supplements um, in terms of them reducing the perception of fatigue. Then you've got your indirect performance improvements, so things like being able to fast track recovery, um, reduce the risk of becoming ill, and therefore you're obviously gonna disrupt any kind of impact on your training schedule. Potentially a just-in-case insurance policy. Uh, obviously, at the elite level, you might have athletes that are actually sponsored by supplement companies, so therefore there's going to be a financial gain. And I think quite a big one that might often be overlooked is if an athlete sees another athlete using a supplement, particularly within their area and discipline, they may feel disadvantaged if they're not also um, engaging in that supplement use. So just to briefly go over uh, some of the boring stuff, I guess, or the not so exciting stuff, but it is important to understand. So in terms of regulation of uh, supplements within Australia, you've probably all heard of the TGA or the Therapeutics Good Administration, and they actually cover the, the pill, the potion, and the powder categories. And again, this falls within this complementary medicine um, industry. Now, unfortunately, there's a few loopholes with the regulation, and what the TGA asks for are of, from manufacturers is they're required only to prove sorry, that products contain pre-approved ingredients. Uh, however, there's no actual requirement of products to prove their claim benefits, okay? So you can start to see how people might take advantage of that when it comes to that advertisement and that marketing in this billion-dollar industry. Uh, secondly, we have the FSANZ, or your Food Standards Australia New Zealand, and these control the sports food portions of the industry, so things like your drinks and your bars. Um, now, they do provide some regulations around the ingredients and the labelling, um, and they do permit a limited number of claims to be included on the product package. But overall, what we can see is your sports supplements do not receive the same level um, of testing as, or, or regulation, I should say, sorry, uh, as your pharmaceutical industry, okay? And the regulating bodies themselves do rely heavily on the honesty from these manufacturers regarding the ingredient quality and also the manufacturing processes. So just a quick note, I guess, on marketing. Now, I'm not here to bag out the West Coast Eagles or Hungry Jacks for that matter, but what I'm trying to push uh, here is we obviously can see that not everything that an elite athlete endorses uh, is going to promote health or performance in our athletes, okay? And we we'll look at this in the context of supplementation. Hopefully everybody knows who Cristiano Ronaldo uh, is, but here you can see him endorsing Herbalife. So again, I'm not trying to upset anybody. Um, Herbalife, for anybody that knows a little bit more about that, is pretty much a pyramid selling scheme. Um, unfortunately, their products don't have any real scientific evidence to underpin their efficacy. Um, and again, if you just look on the back of their products, you'll see they're actually um, containing high amounts of refined sugar as well. So perfect example of you know, an elite athlete here prompting and promoting um, Herbalife nutrition, when in fact, if you know a thing or two about it, you'd probably disagree. Last but not least, obviously a lot of our athletes having a lean body type is going to be very important to them uh, for the performance. Uh, maintaining low body fat percentage is going to be crucial. Um, so you get a lot of these kind of fat burners and you can see all the remarks at the top, no GMO, superior quality, 100% um, lifetime tested, I think. And again, it's just almost, you know, sort of pushing on, on uh, easy targets, I guess, and easy praise being the athlete. Um, and again, obviously, a lot of these products don't have any kind of science underpinning their efficacy. Um, and on the, 
you know, on the flip side, they could actually potentially be quite harmful. What, what do they contain? We don't often know. So fortunately, in Australia, we have two independent companies that inform sport um, and HASTA, which is Human and Sport Test in Australia. And what these two companies do is they put their logo on products uh, available on Australian shelves that have actually been tested to not contain um, contaminated ingredients. Okay, So wherever you see these two logos, you know that there's a significantly lower risk that there's going to be anything dodgy with those products, basically. Okay. What's happened is it's now been built into an app um, created by ASADA, so Australian Sport Anti-Doping um, Authority. Um, and this is a really cool resource that I recommend you guys go check out. So it's an app, you can just have it on your phone. Uh, what happens is you can type any kind of product in there in terms of supplements, and they will tell you whether it's been tested or not. Okay, So they can actually tell you if it's been through this process. Here you can see an example uh, where it has, and here obviously where it hasn't been tested. So this is quite a good way of just, um, you know, simply um, trying to better inform your athletes, I guess, and, and when you're starting to look at different products. So I think it is important just to quickly touch upon the placebo effect, which again, we'll all be well aware of. Uh, this is a 2009 review paper from Sports Medicine, which is a really reputable journal. And what the authors did was they looked at 12 separate studies across a range of performance, um, I guess, areas there. Uh, and what was reported quite, um, I guess, quite significantly, when an athlete was told, when they were given a supplement and they were told this is going to help your performance, regardless of it just being a placebo, a 1% to 5% improvement in performance was observed, okay? So 11 of those 12 studies actually reported either a statistically or cl uh, clinically uh, significant effect. So ultimately, if you tell an athlete something is going to work, it's probably going to work regardless of its actual direct effect. Now, when we're looking at supplement research, unfortunately, a lot of the information that we uh, know about supplements or is spoken of about supplements is actually of the sort of weakest evidence level, if you like. So there's a lot of anecdotes, a lot of observations from athletes of, all oh, this works really well for me. Um, but like I say, without any actual um, hard underpinning science, okay? So a few considerations that we need to think about when we're looking at you know, research studies and the applicability to our um, athletes. Important messages, particular studies, measure and report on very particular things, okay? Some of the kind of specific variables that we need to consider. What were the age of the subjects in the studies? What were their gender? What was their training status? And what were the environment or the test conditions? Now, a subject's habitual diet is extremely important because what we now know is what somebody eats on a daily basis is going to have a really direct impact on their gut microbiome. And we know that somebody's gut microbiome is ultimately going to impact up to 80% of how they respond to a supplement. So that one is really huge, and it's something very, diff uh, sorry, very difficult to control in a research setting. Also, the study length, so how long are they taking the supplement for? Um, are they taking any supplements alongside it? Um, and also, have they actually been exposed to that supplement previously? These are all things that we need to consider. Finally, are there any funding or sponsorship, in, uh, sponsorship implications? So what you'll often see um, in sports nutrition is actual companies are sponsoring these studies. So of course, there's going to be a potential bias, so there's going to be some kind of pressure to report positive and beneficial findings on their products. So overall, um, not to sound too cynical, but unfortunately there isn't strong efficacy for most products on the market. Now there are definitely a few exceptions and I'll allude to that later. Um, but even so, some well-researched supplements can present contradictory results and a good example of that would be fish oils, okay? So overall guys, we really need to consider not only the context of the supplement use, but also the specific protocol employed. Um, and it's not easy, okay? So just to finish up, uh, the message that you often get from sort of the sports supplement world, alpha, at least for those people not endorsing products, is to look at nailing the basics first. So start with um, your foundations, okay, and those being the training stimulus, your recovery strategies, and then the diet itself, but with a food first approach. So the way that I look at supplements is they are very much a supplement, to supplement a diet. Um, and there's a lot of aspects of that diet that you can look at before jumping to supplementation, okay? So some of those being, if we think about energy balance first and foremost, particularly in high volume training um, phases, okay, that's going to be absolutely fundamental. Secondly, macronutrients, okay, so thinking about your protein targets, et cetera, carbohydrate targets, uh, targets sorry, glycogen load, loading, all these types of things. Then you're getting further down the rabbit hole or higher up the ladder, you can start thinking about potential micronutrients. Uh, nutrient timing strategies, again, is getting quite uh, specific now when you're kind of, you know, building your way up. But last 
Uh, last but not least, supplementation is probably going to be your last port of call when you've nailed all the other levels um, beforehand. Okay. Now, the reason people typically tend to jump the gun and, and get straight to supplementation, as you can imagine, behaviour change is hard. If an athlete's not eating very well, um, that's going to be a much longer and more difficult process to saying, just go take this supplement, we think this will cover your bases. Um, so I always think of it as a bit of a band-aid approach. If there are nutrient deficiencies there, give them a supplement, but you're not really fixing the core issue. Okay. And I should have said as well, sorry guys, the input of obviously the overall coaching team, so whether there's a science medical um, support network on hand is obviously going to be really important to ensure these uh, safe protocols. Um, and where that kind of support isn't available to your athletes, and you certainly want to be trying to outsource some um, advice from a sports nutritionist or even a physician. And last but not least, here are some of the resources to potentially look at if you are wanting to get more advice on this area. As I mentioned, the ASADA Clean Sport app. Um, your Australian Institute of Sport have got a whole host of resources on their website. Sports Dietitians Australia or SDA. And finally, a personal favourite of mine for keeping on top of the supplement literature, uh, literature sorry, um, is examine.com. And they have a lot of good researchers um, sort of disseminating the research on there for you guys. Thank you very much.